Welcome back to the Elite Performance Podcast. Today, our guest is James Wild. James is a coach, a consultant, a teaching fellow, and a current PhD student in England. His interests are all things speed, agility, and power. He's also written a book called Strength Trained for Speed, The Scientific Principles and Practical Applications. Um, so today, we have a really great discussion on all things speed development and how James goes about <clears throat> blending his two worlds of being a sports scientist slash researcher and also strength conditioning coach and consultant for many uh, team sport athletes. So we discussed some of the major differences between team sport athletes, such as rugby and lacrosse, their biomechanics and their technical applications compared to actual sprinters and track and field athletes. It was a wonderful discussion. Uh, we, we dig into some of the, the deep, finer details of how he also evaluates and assesses uh, his force velocity characteristics, characteristics of his athletes. And he does a lot of just a great work with his, his, um, <clears throat> his sport teams, his consulting teams, and also his research is very fascinating. So I encourage you guys to look at more James's research. <clears throat> um, and he's very open to this discussion and has a really uh, great mindset and um, cool blending of the science and application with his work. We also want to remind you guys that of our third annual Elite Performance Clinic coming up at our facility on Saturday, April 1st. We brought in a great blend of uh, researchers, sports scientists in the fields of concussion and nutrition, as well as the strength and conditioning side, such as uh, Matt Gifford for uh, speed and agility. We have Brad Gearin talking about mobility, Corey Van Wyk uh, addressing warm-up principles and how to cater them for your training session. So it's overall just a great blend of the science and research and also the application of many different topics we hope you guys are um, interested in that if you are please follow our website at building-better-athletes.com and look click on the elite performance clinic tab and you'll see all the details to that we will also be working on recording all the the topics and presentations for um <clears throat> for sale afterwards if you cannot make it to our facility here in dubuque iowa but without further ado let's get to james because this is a great discussion uh, before we start, though, we did have a few technical difficulties in terms of our audio going in and out, and also we got cut off halfway through. So I tried to patch it up as best as possible, but um, please forgive us for some of those um, a few technical errors and maybe some audio um, errors that are a little bit choppy throughout the, the podcast. But hope you guys enjoy. Let's talk to James. Welcome back to the Elite Performance Podcast. Today our guest is James Wild. James, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, good. Thanks. How you doing? Thanks. Great, great. Hey, let's start with, give us a little background information of what you're doing and how you got to where you're at right now. I did across multiple sports from university through to senior professional level. Um, in, in addition to that, I'm also a, a consultant for a professional uh, rugby team, the Harlequins, who play in the, the Premiership over here. Um, so with them, I deliver speed and agility coaching to a number of testing to uh, help the coaches shape uh, some of their training um, and on top of that I've also been taking on the same capacity with a professional uh, football so soccer team out here working primarily with their academy coaches um, I'm also um, a, a teaching fellow in sport and exercise science at the University of Surrey um, and in the process of completing a PhD in the biomechanics and motor control in acceleration so I enjoy a, a 50 50 split really between applied kind of coaching practice and, and research which is a, a, a split I'm pretty happy with um, and then prior to what I'm doing now I, I, I've undertaken a, a lot of different roles really across sports as a an SNC coach and a long time ago now as a therapist also um, and I have um, spent a lot of my time painstakingly providing uh, sprint mechanics support to a couple of leading sprint groups in the UK also. Um, so yeah, I guess that, that sums things up um, really. I'll, I'll give you the, the, the shortcut version. Absolutely. Excellent. And like you talked about, a lot of that involves speed and you have a, a book out that's called Strength Training for Speed, Scientific Principles and Practical Applications. So can you talk to us about this book and what made you uh, want to write it and kind of what it all entails? 
Sure. Um, so the, the book really, I guess, I used to, like many years ago now, I used to get quite frustrated at not being able to find a single resource really on the topic of strength training for speed. So, um, you know, whilst strength training is only a part of, the, of a much bigger pitch, uh, I was really just kind of seeking one resource which really led me to, to put it together. Um, so, I, I mean, it, it's, I guess it's fairly basic, really. It's a fairly basic text um, designed very much more for a beginner coach or someone who's, you know, um, been, been in the game for a, for a little while, really. But also, I think there's a few bits and pieces in there, hopefully for more experienced people to get their teeth stuck into. But the way I see it, it just provides a good, hopefully basic grounding in some of the fundamentals, really, for strength training for speed. Now, how, what are some ways that maybe uh, strength training for speed differs from kind of your traditional strength conditioning that you might see maybe in American football or, or rugby, where it tends to be more hypertrophy, uh, max strength based? What are some key differences that you would you know, say would be for training for speed compared to, say, training for uh, a team sport such as those? Sure. Well, I guess, you know, if, if we think about it, what, what determines speed? Well, it's our ground reaction force characteristics. So including both the, the magnitude of the force that we're going to produce, um, but also the, the direction and, and, and the rate of force production as well. So I think the last two really are the, the areas where, um, you know, we touched on that might be different from a, a, a more hypertrophy uh, point of view. So, you know, ways in which we can uh, maximize our, our rate of force development um, so you know produce a lot of force in very short period of time is is obviously more critical to speed than just simply the, the total amount of force that you can produce awesome and what are some what are some of your favorite ways to train maybe kind of that direction of force application and your rate force development at rfd in the weight room or in your training well i mean it's a good point and and, and for me it's mainly looking at where the potential deficiencies are for that individual. So I, I have a, a number of um, tests that, that I do to help try and determine where they may be lacking in terms of different strength and power qualities that are, are interrelated that, you know, affect all those kind of abilities really. So that, that's kind of my starting point really. I mean, yes, you know, there, there are standard stuff in terms of explosive lifts, loaded jumps, horizontal jumps, plyos, et cetera, et cetera, that are, you know, generally all round with good exercises help try and maximize that force production and, and in particular the rate of force production. But I think it's about trying to find in each individual what can unlock their potential for force production. And, and you know, that might be different from one person versus another. What, what, are, what are your assessment or evaluation tools are you using to find where they have a force or velocity deficiency? Are you, are you using, I know out there, is the my sprint app? I know that's becoming a little bit more popular. What you know? Are you how are you evaluating their needs in that capacity? Okay, right. Quite a big question. <laughs> um, so if I I start with um, the type of strength power quality assessments that I do first of all. So there are three three main assessments that I do. Um, so a squat jump force velocity profiling. Um, assessment, which is based on the methods of French researchers, uh, Pierre Samazino, J.B. Morin, and their, their operators. So essentially with that, um, if we know um, simple measures, such as the athlete's mass, um, their extended leg length, the push-off distance in, say, a squat jump or whatever the jump it is that you want to measure, um, then we can assess the ballistic leg extension qualities of that individual. Um, now, with that assessment, it's, I guess it's a greater emphasis around the knee extensors compared to the, the, the hip and ankle um, other uh, kind of assessments that, that we do. So that the hip and ankle are obviously pretty important sprinting, which I'll come into in a minute. Um, but with, with that assessment, I guess, due to the, the explosive concentric nature of the squat jump, that the qualities necessary to excel in that are relatively similar to those needed when, say, driving out the blocks in the first, you know, two or three steps or whatever it is from there. Anyway, um, so the, the beauty of the assessment is that, yes, we can, we can look at things such as what an individual peak power is, um, and we know that peak power is related to, say, ballistic push-off performance, 
but that relationship isn't perfect. So there are other things that um, impact how successful that push-off is. So what the, the researchers have found is that um, for a given peak power, there may be optimum levels of force and velocity for that individual that would maximize their jump height. So then it helps you go down the line in terms of your, say, more squat pattern based training where the more higher loads are needed to increase the, the force side of that um, force velocity um, power equation or whether more velocity based methods that might be needed so you know higher force stuff might be okay greater maximum strength type work or you know and then we have the through a continuum of heavy loaded jumps to lighter loaded jumps to unloaded vertical to unloaded horizontal to assisted jumping methods to really ramp up the velocity side. So it can be quite a useful diagnostic tool to help guide that type of training um, for those sort of individuals. So that's one of the assessments I use and I find it very easy to do. Um, and the researchers um, are, are very good and, and they have um, recently, you may well have seen it, but uh, produced a, a paper that's um, you know shown that by narrowing the force velocity deficit, there's an imbalance that that can lead to a significantly greater jump height rather than just trying to continue to um, improve power per se. So that, that's one of my assessments. Um, so that takes care really of the, the, the concentric explosive ability of the knee. So as I said, uh, early acceleration stuff. Outside that, um, I conduct something called a, a hip extensor torque assessment. So I, I kind of stole this test from a guy called John Goodwin, um, who's a researcher, but also a um, practitioner and coach as well. So for this, if, if you imagine lying on your back um, and with your hips positioned under a bar, as if you were gonna try and <coughs> hip thrust, you're right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as if you're gonna try and hip thrust a bar off the floor um, with one heel in contact with the force plate, um, with the hips set to a certain angle, and then the other legs up in the air. So then imagine if you are going to be pushing your heel down into the force plate as if you're trying to raise the bar off the floor, then what we can do is, is uh, measure the peak force that you're providing from your hip extensors. And then from that, we can work out hip extensor torque as well. So ultimately it's the torque during the first, say third of ground contact to the hip that's going to help accelerate you forward the most. Um, so we can look at that and, and with a, a custom rig that I've set up as well, we can look at um, the rate of um, torque development through the hip extensors as well. So help direct where the training needs to be more rate or, or, or uh, more force magnitude um, in the approach that we take for the hip extensors. So that, that's quite an interesting one for me and, and it's uh, turning out to be a particularly reliable test. Um, again, if I touch on some research from um, the Frenchies again, so JB Morin, um, so, you know, fairly recently um, produced um, some good work around the role of the hip extensors and its effect on horizontal force production. And so, you know, he found that concentric hip torque strength, uh, you know, it, it is pretty important, but uh, also when combined with um, glute EMG, glute max EMG, that those two measures were found, and sorry, that, that EMG, like uh, during, during the sprint, and they found that those two methods, or sorry, those two uh, measures were related to that horizontal force production, but primarily during the first, say, seven steps, I think it was, so like maybe the first 10 meters. And then beyond, beyond that, it found that, um, say, biceps femoris EMG activity, um, pre-activation prior to ground contact, and also then when measuring knee flexor um, eccentric torque, I believe it was, that the combination of those together also um, were related to horizontal force production, but across the whole acceleration phase. So, so the hip extensors are, are pretty important. Um, but then the other, the other thing to consider is that you can have the, the most powerful hip extensors in the world, but if you're not able to transmit that force into the ground effectively, then it, you know, you're not gonna be able to realize that power. So on top of my squat jump force velocity, my hip extensor torque stuff, I also do some drop jump of the reactive strength type qualities of, of, of the knee and ankle, particularly the ankle really. Um, so then, you know, if we score well in that, then you stand a relatively good chance of being able to transmit that force from the hip through to the ground. Um, so they're the three main assessments that I look at. Um, and in terms of the results, yes, you know, it, it helps potentially inform the direction that a strength power training might take, but 
it's got to also be considered really within the um, or alongside the running strategy of the individual and, and injury background and that type of stuff as well. Awesome. I'd like to talk about that, that hip extension torque uh, assessment. As, as you talked about, uh, more and more popularity, and I just had an article published in the NSCA Training Conditioning Journal about horizontal exercises, like you said, to initial acceleration or through that whole uh, acceleration phase. So are you, are you finding similar results as J.B. Mormon's group as greater uh, hip extension torque or RFD or whatever you want to, want to say relates to sprinting speed or specifically acceleration speed? Are you finding those same things with your research or your testing? Sorry, you, you cut out a bit towards the, towards the start of that question. Sorry, I heard the end of it, but do you mind saying it again? Yeah, so are, are you finding the same things as J.B. Morin's research? On, on are, you, are you seeing those with greater hip extension torque or power, peak power of that hip extension test? Are, they, are you seeing those same athletes are also the fastest in acceleration or in applying uh, that horizontal force in the nature of the sport or in the nature of sprinting? Right, I, I see what you mean. So... Um, I don't think it's that clear cut. Um, so I typically, typically find that the faster individuals that I'm working with and the, and the majority that the assessments I'm talking about there, I've, I've probably conducted more so on rugby and lacrosse yep. um, athletes as opposed to sprinters, although I have carried them out with sprinters as well, but not in, in the same kind of numbers. But anyway, it's not that clear cut. So for me, you know, you're never going to find a single and test that um, you know completely correlates with, with speed, and therefore just by getting air stream, that something's going to get quicker. What I do tend to find, however, is that um, relatively well-rounded across those assessments. Then typically, those people do seem to be a bit faster out the athletes that I've been working with, but not always. So you know, sometimes I've got people who have scored horribly. In all of those tests, yeah, they're still absolutely rapid, which just kind of blows my mind a bit. But, um, you know, so not always. So I'd say, you know, those that score well-rounded in those tests, generally they seem to sprint faster or, um, you know, there, there's a stronger relationship. But, you know, it's certainly not, not a perfect relationship. And I, and I don't think we'll ever find, you know, something like that. But it does, you know, it gives me a bit of an insight into where this person is potentially lacking to help direct some of the stuff that you do. And as, and as I say, with, with, you know, it's got to be considered within their running strategy as well. So if I've got someone who, um, you know, during, during a sprinting, they're very clearly able to produce very short ground contact times and they're very elastic and what have you. But for whatever reason, they score really poorly in a drop jump assessment. That doesn't mean I'm just going to hammer away its drop jump stuff to try and improve their drop jump score you know so i'm trying to look at their strength power qualities but in relation to how they sprint as well um so you know commonly you you might find that that somebody spends a bit longer on, on the ground um when sprinting might be you, you know less effective in some kind of drop jump assessment and therefore it gives you a, a relatively good indication that they might be lacking that elasticity or, or stiffness to be able to cope with short ground contact times so then that you know gives you a bit more of a clear direction of, of what kind of quality to work on or is it so some of your past research looked at the difference between sport athletes like look uh, rugby lacrosse versus sprinters in terms of their biomechanics or techniques so what are some of the major differences you've seen or your researchers found between team sport athletes compared to actual sprinters Okay, right. So I need to be a little bit careful with what I say because it's part of my PhD research that hopefully some of that will be coming out soon. But um, I guess essentially, you know, that there are quite common differences that you'd expect between some team sport athletes and, and, and sprinters. But I don't think it's necessary, necessarily always as clear cut as therefore it means that the technique that sprinters are adopting the ones that team sport athletes should follow. I mean, broadly, I'd, I'd say yes, that they are. But I think there are certain characteristics that sprinters possess which need to sprint with the technique that they do as well. Um, so if we think about the musculoskeletal structure of a sprinter's ankle, for example, so top sprinters have been shown to um, possess a certain structure of the ankle that permits them to perform um, or produce a greater amount of force during a ground contact and an acceleration step. 
um, mainly due to um, having a shorter plantar flexor moment arm. So uh, for a given joint rotation, due to the um, force velocity properties of the muscle, they can produce more force, um, but within the same kind of time period as someone else. So therefore, if, if we're looking at trying to make a change such as a team sport athlete taking his foot closer to his center of mass in order to deal with that shorter ground contact time, then he's got to have some kind of underlying physical change that needs to take place for him to be able to do that without sacrificing performance. Now, it doesn't mean that he can't do that, but we need to put in place the physiology and, and what have you to help cope with that. Um, so I think there are certain techniques or certain positions that will be out of reach for some team sport athletes just because of certain structural differences and, and other differences like that. Um, but yeah, generally, you, you know, you can imagine. So during acceleration, you're not going to have the same kind of forward lean for most team sport athletes compared to sprinters because they won't be as explosive and powerful. Um, and, you, you know, the classical high knee position, they're not going to be able to reach that. And as often, they, they typically don't tend to, or the ones I've worked with anyway, have the ability to stabilize pretty well in those type of positions. Um, but then also we've got to consider, well, you, you know, it's a part of their game. So yes, it's a very important part to run in a straight line, but they've got to be able to do a lot more things and just simply run straight. Um, so there are a lot of other training factors that impact on their time um, to be able to develop better um, sprinting technique, if that makes sense. Yes, yes. So do you think it is a worthwhile endeavor for, for team sport coaches, strength conditioning coaches, uh, speed coaches to, to work on some of these technical uh, applications such as bridging the gap between them and a sprinter? There is, is it a worthwhile endeavor or is it just a product of their game that, uh, you know, improving some of these acceleration top end max V mechanics uh, that will actually benefit their sport? Is it worthwhile? Oh, but yeah, I hope so because otherwise I'd be out of a job. <laughs> But um, yeah, no, I think definitely it is. And, and um, you know, depending on the setup of the, the um, team and their organization, you know, that they'll be very good individuals in place, but they might not necessarily have much experience in the way of, of sprint coaching. So it's um, often that those type of team sport athletes haven't had the right exposure to that. Um, so yeah, I definitely think it's worthwhile because ultimately, you know, if, if we can get an athlete expressing more force into the ground in, in a better direction, then even if the type of work that we do does not directly transfer over from a context point of view. So, you know, team sport athlete in, in most sports will rarely start from a standing start, you know, they'll be rolling or, or changing direction or what have you. But even so, even if we are able to get them to express more force into the ground in training and sprinting, then it's certainly going to improve their power qualities anyway that, that, that will carry over if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but also, and, and you know, generally a lot of the um, techniques and, and, and stuff that you, you might go through to improve that more or enhance a more typical sprint type technique will take, take team sport athletes into body positions they're not used to going into. So that classic high knee type position, if we're stepping over hurdles or marching or, you know, whatever it is, we're building a tissue tolerance around and the hip to be able to cope with holding a better position. So, yeah, I, I definitely think that there's, you know, many, many uh, benefits of, of, of bridging that gap. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so when a lot of coaches think about sprinting, they often um, get the old school definition of, of stride rate or time stride length. Uh, but we, we kind of know that that's just a byproduct of, like you said, the magnitude of the force, the direction of the force, and the kind of the rate of that force. But um, some interesting research came out and you kind of talked about in the past was, that athletes tend to be frequency or length reliant. Um, can you talk about what this means and what it might mean for coaches that are training athletes that may be uh, frequency reliant versus length re reliant? Sure. So, um, you know, so a lot of people will, will quite rightly so measure step length and, and step rate because, you know, ultimately they are what make up sprinting speed. Um, but a lot of people will, will assume that, um, you know, if, say, step rate or step length is down relative to some standardized norms or something like that, then the side that's lower should be worked on to help improve performance. I know I think I, I do agree with that to an extent. Um, I think you're onto a winner if you have someone with higher step rate naturally because 
it's a much harder quality to work on. So for me, you know, if you've got someone who's got a, a higher step rate naturally, then it's much easier to build on their step length. And so you're onto a bit of a winner there. Um, and, you know, that's an approach that people can take. I think there's also more scope to look at what, what you said is whether people are more step length or step rate reliant. So um, some of the research that, that I've looked at, um, um, uh, my, God, I should know his name, one of my PhD supervisors, and Dr. Ian Bazzoda is based at Cardiff um, and his research group. So they, they've looked at this quite a bit. So whether they have measured um, an athlete's step length and step rate, say across a season, in competition, in training and what have you. And they'll have been able to identify that whether for that athlete it's when their step rate or step length is greater um, that seems to be maximizing their sprint performance. Or if I put it another way, when they're sprinting faster, it's either an increase more so in their step length or step rate that seems to um, correlate to that sprint performance. So Whilst I, I still think it's unclear necessarily where you go with that, it, it might help inform. Um, so going into competition, um, you know, the few weeks or, or out or, or however long out you are, and, and if you want to fine tune things, and we know that right, we've got a, a step length reliant athlete here. So in other words, when their step length is greater, they're typically running faster. Then you might look to direct your your kind of training parameters around that. So, you know, it might be early in the season or, or what have you, you're working across both aspects or, or looking to try and increase the one that's generally lower, but then going into competition and in, in working on their strengths, you might then look to focus on which one they're more reliant on, if that makes sense. But I think there's still, you know, a lot more research that needs to be done in that area, but I definitely think it's, it's an interesting um, thing to think about. Yeah, how about um, not only the training that you might provide for them, but how about your coaching? So if you have a a reliance kind of, uh, you know, for, for frequency type athlete, would it be beneficial or detrimental to give them more length type of cueing? So if they're kind of a stride rate type of athlete, is it bad to maybe give cues that take them away from that reliancy or do you want to dictate your cue and your coaching towards those strengths? Yeah, well, I, I think it, you know, it's, it depends. This is the kind of short answer. It depends on many factors. So, I think, um, you know, if someone's naturally stride, um, sorry, step length, or sorry, let me start again. If someone's naturally step rate reliant, and you look into kind of enhance that step rate leading into competition, then it would make sense to try and drive your cueing towards the development of their step rate. Um, but I, I don't think there's necessarily one cue or two cue that, that can drive that thing for across the board. I think it's something that's quite or potentially fairly unique to each individual and, and often it might not be a cue at all that you need to um, you know help enhance one or the other so very often I find that you know the athletes who, who have typically a good understanding of the whole area and are fairly well educated in it will typically know what to be able to do without to have too much of your kind of input if that makes sense and um, other, other thing to consider as well that if someone's naturally more um, step rate reliant, then you'd like to think that if you're getting them fresh for training and just letting them sprint as fast as they can, that they'd be working on that side anyway. So I, I think sometimes we need to remove ourselves from it and just let them kind of crack on with it, if, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so coaches are always looking for uh, different drills to improve acceleration and max V technique, mechanics, etc. cetera. Um, you've talked about having different focuses on drills that emphasize specific aspects or qualities of sprinting. Um, could you discuss about the different qualities drills should seek to enhance or emphasize? Yeah. Um, so why do I use sprinting drills? I guess for me, um, yes, it's to partly reinforce key technical positions that we're ideally looking for. So, you know, Yes, whilst each um, individual does um, sprint according to their unique kind of makeup and what have you, there may be certain things that, that we'll look for that we want to enhance. So we'll, we'll generically have a broad um, technical model that we'll be working towards. So some of the drills that uh, we choose would ideally be enhancing those areas. Um, now, how, how, it, how they do that for me is probably not that well understood by people. Um, and there's certainly a lack of research in, in this area, really. So um, 
I find for um, for team sport athletes, for ex- example, I get the most mileage out of drills in terms of trying to help facilitate technical change more so than more experienced or, or, or sprint type athletes. Um, so one of the things I, I find that the drills are very useful for is helping create some kind of context for the sprint work that you might do afterwards. So if you can attach a feel of what you want through some type of drill, whatever it is, um, then I think it's much easier following that drill going into some sprint efforts for them to be able to hold on to what that feels like in the drill and be able to try and move some way towards that with the actual sprinting effort. So being able to provide that context and that feeling for me is really quite important. And as I say, for team sport athletes, that's where I think I've had the biggest success in trying to make some kind of technical adjustment. Sorry, my light's just gone out in this room. I just need to move around a bit for the light to come back on. Um, so, yeah, so definitely creating context, I think, is one, one of the things. But, but also um, from a purely like a... Uh, physical development point of view I think they're pretty important as well so you know some people might say that well it's to help reinforce neural pathways you know blah 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 which yeah, yeah okay but you know if we're again if I'm thinking about a team sport athlete if we're in interested in trying to help promote a better foot strike one that's um, more crisp with shorter ground contact time or one, what have you then a lot of the drills that we do are essentially low intensity plyometric work so if we're being able to get exposure, or team sport athletes exposed to that type of work, you know, two, three, four times a week for multiple weeks, then we're going to be generally building up the type of strength and reactive qualities around the ankle to help promote a better foot strike pattern and also help transmit the force better into the ground. So I think from a, you know, a physical point of view, they're, they're really quite important to generate those qualities. Um, you know, coaches will place quite a large emphasis on mechanical fish technique, um, typically with the view to optimise the ground reaction force um, production, but also to, to limit loading tissues inappropriately. Um, so again, if we can maybe get them positioned and strengthen them in better alignment during a ground contact, then from an injury prevent, uh, prevention point of view, I think that's quite important. Um, yeah, can't really remember what the question was originally about, but <laughs> but drills, yeah. So that's that's where I'm at the minute. <laughs> yeah, because in terms, I should have. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I should say just, it seems like some coaches just kind of haphazardly put together some skips, some marches, some a runs without much of an understanding of what they're trying to accomplish or having any kind of like you said context or yeah. feeling for it to apply later in more of an open environment, an interactive environment. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, so you know, for me, it's, I always find much more success in selecting fewer drills, but doing more of them and more of the right ones for the right type of people. Um, so I'm quite a fan of, um, you know, some of the drills that, that come out of, um, oh, I don't want to say Altis, but they're not Altis anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, they're Altis now. What's that? They're, they're, they're all this. They used to be, I think, world performance or something. But they're oh, all this. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, forgive me. But, you know, so like dribble type activities I find particularly useful for, um, you know, working on better front side mechanics and, and, and top end type stuff. So, you know, again, if we're talking about our team sport athletes and, and let's say that we conducted a sprint force velocity um, uh, assessment and we're identifying whether some are more and force or velocity dominant and therefore better in the early stage of acceleration or top end and what have you, then we might base drills around that. So typically if we have people that need to develop the velocity side and get greater at max velocity, then we might be trying to um, fine tune their front side mechanics more through dribble type activity, which, you know, again, for those guys serves quite well to as a plyometric type activity, really, in terms of getting a lot of stiff, short ground contact but also helping whip the leg through into better front side stuff. Whereas other athletes, let's say that they um, they need more work on a horizontal force um, magnitude and also directional point of view, then we might work on, say, accelerated, um, sorry, resisted acceleration bounds with a band or 
some march type work to help get through it, you know, you know, snap your knee position or, or whatever it is. So I, I, I think you're right. I think a lot of coaches will fall into the trap of just selecting a load of different drills and then just go through them, but not only go through them, but go through them quite poorly. So, which then just means, you, you know, what was the point in doing them? So for me, you're better off trying to be a little bit more targeted with it. And um, yes, you might have some generic drills that, that everyone does, which is, which is good. I'm, I'm a fan of that. But if you're going to do them, make sure that they do them properly because otherwise it's, it's, it's a waste of time. And then beyond that, yeah, having your two or three for different groups, you know, to work on certain aspects as well. Awesome, awesome. So is there something this year that you, uh, you know, maybe you're experimenting around with, with your training, with your teams, um, that's new this year that you've done, haven't done, or differently than the years past? Oh, good question. Um, not necessarily so much that, that's different, but I think I'm starting to try and monitor things in a slightly different way. So I, I alluded to the, um, say, the sprint false velocity profiling again that, that comes from Sam Zeno and, and, and his guy. So what I'm starting to do with, with a lot of the, the work with the athletes that, that I do now is, is try and collect as much data around that as possible and then try and see off the back of the training interventions what effect that has in terms of their, their sprint force velocity profile um, both in terms of you know, ratio of force and, and, and you know, you know, their um, horizontal force production theoretical maximum running velocity and all that kind of stuff not necessarily I'm not acting on it yet because I don't think we've got quite enough information on it yet to make fully informed decisions for each individual and you know we're pretty happy with where things are going but yeah i think that's certainly helping or that's certainly something that i'm doing that's different from a monitoring point of view to see um you know how our programs relate to those characteristics but then how do those force velocity power characteristics relate to the way in which people sprint so alongside you know being interested in sprinting performance i'm very interested in the ways in which different people sprint so you know if you're working i don't know, give you an example say you work alongside a track coach and the track coach wants to take this individual from this type of technique to this type of technique whether it's right or not you know how can you best facilitate that process and um, so that that's the type of thing that i'm, I'm particularly interested in at the minute yeah, that'd be very interesting. I mean, I know, like you said, it's early. You haven't collected enough data, but anything interesting on the front end that you could like to share or could share? Um, well, I guess what, what's quite interesting to me is so that there's, um, if we're talking about so the um, ratio of force production where they're come, driving out from the first car in two steps, so where that ratio of force is going to be greatest, um, I'm generally seeing some kind of relationship with like center of mass angle at toe off. So if you imagine you were to draw a, a line from, you know, the, the contact foot from that toe at toe off through the center of mass, as you'd kind of imagine the, the steeper the angle, so the more forward inclined the athlete essentially seems to be relating to a um, greater ratio of force in those first few steps. However, again, it, it's not a, clear-cut relationships are so like it's a uh, uh, moderate but so i'm still getting individuals who are bolt upright or not bolt upright but more upright than others that are still able to produce quite a high ratio of force so for me this is you know gets you thinking well you know there's different strategies to reach the same outcome you know and, and is trying to change someone more preferable or not and therefore, based on the different body positions, you know, the people who are more upright, are they, for example, reliant more on the hip than the knee and ankle to, you know, propel them forward or what have you? So, again, it, it's all stuff that I'm looking into, but it, it, it's all areas that, that, that particularly interest me at the minute. Yeah, that'd be good. I look forward to uh, seeing some of those results you get later on and when you get more data. That'd be, that's, that's really interesting. Um, James, go ahead and give us three books that have changed or greatly impacted the way you coach or your, or even your scientific career. Oh, that's a horrible question. <laughs> Do you know what? It's, it's one of those things that the older I've got, I probably lead, read less in the way of books now. It's, it's quite a, a sad indictment of my life, but I'm obviously pretty busy at work, a wife and two kids, so life's pretty crazy. So most of my reading now, unfortunately, is, um, I say unfortunately, but it's very much journal research related. So I can't remember the last time I actually read a whole book all the way through. 
In fact, I can't tell you the last time I've read a whole book in its entirety. <laughs> so I tend to dip into a lot of different books, um, look at a lot of, you know, I'll read paragraphs here and there, chapters here and there. Um, so to say, it's quite sad from my side, really. But do you know what? I don't think I'd actually be able to give you three books that I think has changed what I do or impacted. I think it's uh, an amalgamation of lots of different information from different resources that's done that, really, through bits of books from journal articles, from stuff on the internet and chats with people. It's, you know, I, I can't answer that question. <laughs> How about, this might be even diff more difficult. How about three of your uh, favorite research articles or ones that have stimulated the most thought for you? I don't know if you can put those on top of your head. I know that's a tough one too. Um, Does that ring, ring the bell that you could, you know, our readers could go uh, follow and listen? I'll tell you what, I, I can't remember the, the name of the journal article, but there's a, an excellent piece on periodization from John Keeley. Yeah, yep, um, yep. great one, yeah. I, I think it's a great one. It, it's one that he's it, it, it just written very well. It's articulated it, you know, very proficiently. And it's areas, that, you know, it's stuff that had always been running through my mind and it was just nice to see it there in writing, if, if you know yeah. what I mean, just to help kind of clarify some of the gray areas. So I really like that paper. I think that's pretty good. Um, oh. Beyond that, I'd, uh, I think I'd, I'd say it at, at the minute, a, a lot of the research that, that Sam Azino and, and Maureen are, are churning out, and I think is particularly interesting. It, you know, I think we often get carried away with a lot of areas sometimes and, you know, you know jump ahead with one thing, but I think just the body of research they're building up is re really interesting. I know some people you know, suggesting, oh, it's nothing new, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I think there's some really serious, good research that's been done that's not just, um, you know, theory now, but it's, you know, you know clearly showing that out, out the, the practical end of it is um, definitely coming through. Yes. All right, we'll transition here to, if you could have dinner with any three people that are alive in the world, who would they be? Who, would, who are you inviting to dinner with you? Three people. Do you know what? I'd, I'd go with something really random. Um, something like I think I'd have Arnie, Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, <laughs> Steven Seagal, and um, Jean Claude Van Damme. I think what a weird, wonderful combination that would be over dinner. That's some ass kickers right there. <laughs> you'd, you'd be able to get in a couple of bar fights or something. They'd have your back. It'd be nice. Hopefully, yeah. Awesome, James. Hey, this has been a great talk. Uh, I know we had a couple uh, technical difference uh, difficulties, but thanks for hanging in there. Um, sure. Where, where can listeners find you more on social media or, uh, where can they find your book, etc.? Um, so the, the book I, I believe is available on, on Amazon. It certainly is in, in the UK. I, I think a couple of people in the U S have managed to get hold of it as well that way. So the book's on Amazon. Um, other than that, I, I don't know. I, I'm not really that much on social media. I've got a Twitter account, which I, I do use from time to time. Um, the name on that is wildy underscore JJ. Um, but I don't really, outside of that, um, I haven't really got much in the way of social media, but uh, people are welcome to email me at j.wild at surrey.ac.uk as well. Um, yeah, so that's probably about it. Well, great, James. I appreciate you taking the time today, and uh, thanks for sharing such a great amount of good information. No, thanks very much. Good to talk. Please join me in making James Wild for a great discussion today. And boy, did he share a ton of great information on all things speed, from the biomechanics, the kinematics, and the techniques of team sport athletes compared to uh, actual track and sprinter athletes. Um, some of the assessments that he used in terms of vertical versus horizontal versus reactive factor strength indexes and how they'll dictate his training. Uh, overall, just a great discussion. Um, James did a fascinating job, um, and he was a great talk to. So also a great guy to uh, follow um, on Twitter and look at his research. And also his book, um, uh, Strain, Strength Training for Speed, is also a great read for any kind of coach. He, he talked about more being for novices and beginners, but I can tell you that even as an uh, experienced coach, you'll have a lot to take away from his great book. So go on Amazon, pick that sucker up, um, and enjoy, enjoy the content. So until next time, guys, we'll speak to you guys next time on the Elite Performance Podcast.